for my whole life, people have told me that I can't do things. And here I am on the start line as Paralympic champion of a home Paralympic Games. I mean, if that's not proving people wrong, I don't know what is. Hello, Chris here, and welcome to My Defining Moments, where for this episode, there's a hurricane on the way. That's right, Hurricane Hannah Cockroft is zooming in to talk to me about the five defining moments of her career so far. Hannah became a wheelchair world champion while still in her teenage years, winning the first of 12 world titles in the T34 category. A double gold at her home Paralympics in 2012 saw her catapulted into the nation's hearts. A further three Paralympic golds followed in Rio, and in 2017, she became the first para-athlete to be named Sportswoman of the Year by the Sports Journalist Association. It hasn't always been freewheeling for Hannah, as you'll find out when she reveals her five defining moments. Hi Hannah, thank you so much for joining me on My Defining Moments podcast. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, not too bad, thanks. How has this year been for you, actually? Just to start with that, what's it been like? It's been very different to what I had planned. Um, amazingly, it feels like it's kind of flown by, and I don't really know what I've done, but, well, nothing. For the first year in about 13 years, I haven't really done anything, which has been quite nice. Um, but yeah, this year's been odd. We've had to make a lot of changes, had to be very creative with training, um, but in a way that that's kind of opened up a lot of opportunities and it's, it's yeah it's been quite good actually to realize what's around you and what you can use when tracks and gyms aren't aren't there so it's not all been bad yeah it does seem like this year I can't decide if it's gone quick or slow it's like <laughs> it's been a very strange one yeah I can't it's weird looking back on a year and being like oh I've done three races and that's it <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then let's start at the beginning of your story. What was your childhood like uh, growing up in Halifax? So my childhood was really good. Um, I had two cardiac arrests when I was born, um, which left me with multiple areas of brain damage and uh, deformed feet and deformed legs, so mobility problems uh, mainly. But, um, you know, when I was born, doctors kind of told my parents not to expect too much from me, that I wouldn't really live an independent life. Um, you know, not to push me too hard and not to expect too much. And you know what? As much as, you know, they took heed of that, they didn't take it as the gospel. I have two able bodied brothers and I just got brought up. So whatever they did, I did. And it was it was just a very normal upbringing, I think. Um, doesn't everyone say that? Um, just went to mainstream school. I was always the only disabled child. Um, and the only thing I didn't do growing up was sport, funnily enough. So um yeah that was always the one thing that I was kind of turned away from and, and told it wasn't for me and yet here I am <laughs> well yeah um did you did you want to do sport was that something you were you like a sports fan or were you always trying to be active when you were a kid um I think I was quite a lively child uh and my my younger brother and my dad are quite sporty so it was always something you know I'd, I'd go and watch my my little brother's rugby games and kind of watch it and I don't know I have a bit of a bit of jealousy because I wanted that teamwork. I wanted, I liked what I saw on the pitch, but I just thought, well, it's not there for me, so I can't have it. And um, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't sported because it wasn't an option. But I think, it, you know, it was never my dream to be a Paralympian either. So uh, this definitely wasn't the aim. Uh, I just eventually found sport when I was twelve and wanted to try everything because that's the kind of person I am and. Yeah, <laughs> just carried it on, I think. I'm still trying stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> so you said you were 12 then when you started. Was that was that school? How how did you first get into it? Um, so I actually started sport playing wheelchair basketball. My school invited the local team along to do like a, a demonstration. The, the, the team were doing like a tour of all the local secondary schools. So it was kind of just our turn. It wasn't... Um, planned it wasn't put in place for me or anything like that it was just by chance and yeah I saw these guys rock up in these sporty chairs and it was just like that day a whole new life started for me really you know I got in this chair and it wasn't 
a big heavy NHS clunky foldable thing that you could barely move yourself it was fast and it was looked cool and yeah it was I was just hooked straight away and um made my contacts and that was it I was away I started training with the club outside of school time and uh they just in in got me involved in so many different sports you know obviously played basketball with the team but they also tried me out with a bit of wheelchair rugby a bit of wheelchair tennis um yeah all sorts and uh eventually found found my calling at wheelchair racing well yeah via discus i think wasn't it it was yeah once school had uh had the team in they kind of realized that maybe i was a little bit more able than they'd given me credit for and uh that actually, you know, it's very easy to adapt a PE lesson to for a disabled person's needs. You know, I wasn't expecting to do cross country and I wasn't upset when I couldn't do cross country, but there was no difference between everyone else sitting down and throwing it, uh, everyone else standing up and throwing a discus and me sitting down and throwing one. Um, so, yeah, started just adapting PE lessons like that uh, from then onwards, uh, just doing what we could. And I ended up getting invited to the uh, school games. To represent Yorkshire and Humberside, won a silver medal in a seat of discus, and that was the first time I saw wheelchair racing. So, you know, why not give it a go? Done everything else. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, that kind of brings us on to the first defining moment you've given me, which is the first time that you sat in a race chair about what, 15 years old? Yeah, I was 15. Uh, it was the back end of 2007 when I first sat in a race chair. Um, yeah, so after winning the silver medal, I got invited down to a talent ID day with British Athletics. Um, it's basically just like they invite young athletes down to try out sports that they otherwise might not have access to. So wheelchair racing was one of them. Um, I had seen it already at the school games. It looked really cool. But then when I saw the chairs close up and had the opportunity to get in one, I was a bit like, oh, no, I, I don't know if I want to get in that anymore. But my dad, being a typical Yorkshire man, was like, well, we've driven all this way, so you're getting in it. I had to try every single sport that day. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I just, um, I just got in the race chair and, you know, I'd had the speed and I'd had the sportiness in basketball, um, you know, for a few years now. But the race chair was just a whole new sense of freedom and independence that I'd never had before. You know, when you're on the basketball court, it's great but you have to stop pushing because there's a wall and you have to pass the ball because there's a team. Um, whereas out on the track, it's just me. It's just the track. I can go as fast as I want for as long as I want. And there's no one saying, you know, be careful or, you know, try and involve someone else or do this or you're not relying on anyone else. And I just instantly just loved the freedom that it gave me. Because up until that point, you know, my whole life just, involved adults in some way which isn't really normal for a 15 year old but everyone was just always trying to keep me safe which I guess is nice um and I think at that age you, you just want something that's just yours you know you want that space to be yourself and wheelchair racing gave me that so I just loved it straight away and did the session and the next weekend uh the session was with um Tanny Gray Thompson's husband Ian Thompson so the next weekend I was uh, up at their house, borrowing a race chair and getting given my first ever ra racing session. So, yeah, it moved pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, it did. Uh, well, and so did you. By the sound of it, <laughs> you were soon <laughs> you were soon there, like uh, well, competing in things like the London ma Mini Marathon and all that. And did you enjoy those kind of early races? I loved them. I loved them because at that point, it you know, it wasn't about winning and losing. It was just about being there and going quick and learning, really. Uh, some of my first races were against Tane and uh, some of their other athletes. And it was nice. You still had an element of that teamwork. But at the same time, you know, the, the work was down to you. Um, I mean, I'll always have fond memories of the, the mini marathons. Uh, I think I did my first mini marathon like six months after I first got in a race chair, if that. And I won it. So, uh, yeah, I just just enjoyed it and it was such a good experience you know the crowds that line up and watch and just all the people that come out and cheer for you I think uh, that that was one of the hookers to it like oh people like watching this so I'm gonna carry on <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, you mentioned obviously Tanny Gray Thompson there. I mean, was and obviously working with Ian was that that must have been a great start and to see what she's achieved in her career, it must have given you hope that you know it it could be a career for you. I think it's the dream start, really, isn't it? You can't uh, ask for any any more than that to to start wheelchair racing with the absolute top person in the sport. Um, it was definitely kind of priceless, you know. When you're starting out, you need the advice, you need all the expertise you can get, and they just had it there waiting for me and just piled it onto me really so I learned from the best straight away I never really learned any uh, bad habits or anything because <laughs> they were never going to pass that on so yeah it was it was the best start and uh, yeah like you say I mean I remember going into Tani's house and she had like the doors propped open with London Marathon trophies and just like medals as coasters on the table it was mad and I just remember looking at it like oh my god imagine having that many of them that you can just do that with it but Kind of get it now. <laughs> <laughs> You've reached that point. <laughs> um, yeah, that was, yeah, it's like you say, Tani, obviously a great inspiration. Would, had you watched the Paralympics much growing up? Was it was it a big part of your life? No, so probably the first games I remember properly watching was, was 2008. So kind of after I'd started wheelchair racing. Um, prior to that, I didn't really know anything about the Paralympic Games or any of it. Um, I was brought up in a very able-bodied world you know I didn't have any disabled friends I was just one of everyone else and it was a great it was a great way to grow up you know I wouldn't change it for the world but obviously had I known about the Paralympics then maybe I would have moved into para sport a lot sooner than I did you know 15's quite old to be starting wheelchair racing um who knows how many more medals I could have if I'd started earlier but I don't yeah I don't regret any part of it but um yeah, Beijing was the first games that I watched, and then four years later, I was I was there. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. In twenty ten, you started working with Peter Eriksson, who was the head of um, UK Para Sport at the time uh, for, for athletics. Um, what was his inspiration like over your, your career? Oh, Peter will always be my top man. Bless him. Uh, I was very sad when I had to let him go as my coach. He just. I think he made me into the athlete that I am. You know, he made me hardy. Eh? He taught me lessons the hard way. Uh, you know, I remember one one day um, I was on a training camp and all my friends were going out that afternoon. So I was like, right, I'm just going to do both my training sessions in the morning. Uh, so went out, rammed out like 20 miles because I was dead keen to go out. I think we were going to the beach or something. Went to the beach and he always scared me a little bit like I had so much respect for him that I never wanted to upset him just remember my phone ringing him and him being like you're not in your chair where are you I'm coming I'm coming so I ended up doing three sessions that day because I didn't want to upset him wow. <laughs> but um yeah he always he, he taught me everything I knew and I'm still keeping regular contact with him and um obviously he brought me my first my first little pieces of success so I have a lot to thank him for yeah, he's yeah a very inspirational man for parasport in the UK. Um, I was looking at uh, May 2010. Most like people of that age would be doing their A levels, and you were. Uh, you but then you were also prom queen. But then you just casually dropped in seven world records in eight days. <laughs> it was a very, very busy week. <laughs> yeah, so just yeah. How how was that week in your life? As one little nugget of <laughs> of your life, a lot happened in that week. Yeah, so I brought my first ever world record uh, just before my A-levels started. Um, and no one knew I'd broken it, actually. I didn't know. Just It was a 400 metres. I did a 400 metres in Liverpool. And like four hours after the race, uh, Dave Weir came over with like a big bouquet of roses. And I was like, well, this is weird. And he was like, oh, you just brought your first world record, didn't you know? And I was like, nope. Didn't have a clue. No one told me that. Um, and then, yeah, sat my A level exams, and uh, I remember did my English lit was my last exam. Went straight from there to my prom. Obviously, couldn't really party. I think I was at prom for like two hours because I had a five a.m. flight to Switzerland the next morning. Um, I was I was late to Switzerland. The whole the whole team had already flown out, so I was the last one out, which meant I had to stay in a different hotel to everyone else because everyone else had filled up the team hotel. Um, got there, broke yeah seven world records in eight days. Uh, came home and slept for a long time. <laughs> yeah, not surprised. <laughs> 
I mean, it does seem like from only being in a, a chair for the first time in 2007 to then be doing that three years later, did you feel like it happened a bit quick? Not really. Um, you know, a lot of people think it happened really quick, but I think I was just really lucky. You know, I, I threw myself into the training very quickly. I didn't really build into a full training program. I literally just started it. You know, I went from nothing to six days a week straight away. I went from no gym work ever to gym work straight away. We we just did it all. Um, and obviously, Tani and Ian kind of built the building blocks with me and then Peter built on that uh, and, and helped me work more on my technique and, you know, the chair set up and things like that. And I think that was the biggest difference for me. 2010 was when I got my first ever fitted race chair up until that point. Um, I'd raced in one that was made for Ian, so... Obviously, a, a chair made for a 40-year-old man on a 16-year-old girl is not going to be the best fit. Um, so once I had the equipment, I was away, really, and I'd had the best start. So I worked hard, but I worked hard well, if that makes sense. I wasn't, like I said, taught bad habits at any point. I just got in and, and got started, and it was never a hunt for world records or anything. I just... I just loved what I did. So I went and trained in my lunch breaks at school. My mum would come and pick me up and I'd go training and come back. And then we'd go back to the track in the evening after school. I'd get up and do gym sessions before school. You know, it was it was as much dedication from my parents as it was from me. Um, and I'm lucky that they supported that. But, you know, it, it just happened. I never really, <laughs> never really planned it or prepared for it. Just, And I think as well, a massive thing for me is when I'm not focusing too hard on my performance, I always seem to do better. Um, I was thinking so hard about my ear levels that, um, you know, the, the racing was a nice distraction. It was a nice little break from revising and exams. So just made the most of it and it paid off. And what was the, like, the reaction of your school friends and all that? You know, you're coming back from breaking world records and jetting off to Switzerland. They must have thought, who is this? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they noticed. They still don't notice. They just just get on with it. They're just like, oh, right, you're trading again. Didn't you do that yesterday? <laughs> 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 you know, obviously, they were proud, but I don't I think they really understood what I was doing. Um, it was just a hobby. So you don't normally celebrate someone's hobby and... I was doing well at it and it was only really kind of 2012 that I think everyone kind of sat up and went, oh, that's what you do. I understand it now. Um, so, yeah, it was uh, strange because obviously they were all just enjoying their nice long summer before they went to uni and I was just flying around the world and I don't know, I think they thought I was on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> um, 2011, first world champs, two gold medals. That was, surely that must have been the perfect start to your senior career bit of shock um I was taken to the world championships uh just to fill a space on the team so every team has to have a set number of male and female athletes um and obviously with Peter being the head coach he was just like well you might as well come along bit of experience see if you enjoy it getting back doubled world champion so uh not what anyone expected but again I think I was just really enjoying myself I mean I was just gone 18 so if someone said to an 18 year old do you want a month in New Zealand with all your friends you obviously jump at the chance um but yeah I had no idea what that would lead on to I mean it's it's crazy when I think back to that world championships how small it felt compared to compared to what they are now you know I think the event was still growing and building and um, we probably had like 200 people in the stands absolute max so uh it, it kind of felt small and again didn't feel that big a deal so I just got on with it um, and things just snowballed very quickly. <laughs> yeah um, you must have known though obviously with the Paralympics being in London the next year that that was a realistic target for you and then suddenly you go from being oh I'll I'll go and enjoy a home Paralympics and then just oh I'm now going in as a double <laughs> world champion. I didn't really consider the London Games until I became world champion. You know, I'd kind of gone, oh, you know, I'd bought my tickets to go and watch kind of thing, thinking, oh, it's, it's too soon because, you know, my target games was actually Tokyo. So wow, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit ahead. Um, <laughs> but the games that Peter was training me up for was, was for Tokyo to, to win gold there. So um, I don't know. I, 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 
just took to the sport, I guess, and, and made it my life. And I don't know, maybe people think didn't think I was going to commit to it like I did, or I'm not sure, but um, I fast forwarded a few years too early. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think it was only in New Zealand that pe- Peter kind of said, right, I think, I think we need to think about London because uh, everything else is a bit too far away now. <laughs> and then how was that build up? Because obviously London, you know, big, big event, you know, it was always going to be well attended. It was always going to be covered well in the UK. There must have been, was there any, did you feel any pressure? I never felt any pressure. Uh, I didn't feel nervous at any point going to London. I just felt excited the whole time, but the actual build up to it was rapid. You know, I thought that I was a elite and professional athlete going into the World Championships, but coming away and building up to London 2012, I had to change who I was as a person to get through it. You know, it was it was like new diet plans, new gym sessions, you know, deferring university, uh, dropping out of college because I went to college after you after sixth form. Um, it was literally like right, commit to this or or don't you have to make a decision now and with Peter as a coach you you just commit (laughs) (laughs) there's no half heart in anything you either do it or you don't do it um so I just you know sat down with my parents and said look this is this is a one chance thing you know not no one else is ever going to get this opportunity so I might as well just defer uni places and and go for it um so yeah it was a, a tough kind of couple of years really year and a half um I mean the the beginning of 2012 January 2012 I was 59 kilos and then the start line of London 2012 was 51 kilograms so they literally just like made me into a little ball of muscle (laughs) (laughs) and then uh and then off we went yeah, and well, that yeah leads me straight on to your second defining moment, which is obviously London 2012 and the two gold medals that you won. Not only was it like it was the first it was the first gold medal on the track for Great Britain at the games, and yeah, then the second one was on that magical night, that Thursday night. Um, just talk us through those emotions and that that whole crazy week. Yeah, it was a crazy week. I mean. I couldn't really leave this out of my defining moments, could I? It's the moment no. that made me as an athlete. So, um, yeah, London was incredible. And having obviously now experienced other world champs and other Paralympic Games, I kind of kind of wish it wasn't my first. I don't feel like I appreciated it for everything that it was. Um, it, it was massive. Um I didn't feel nervous at any point, not the holding camp, not going into the village. Like the whole time I was just buzzing. I was just like, ah, look where we are. Um, the village was just something I'd never seen before. You know, all these athletes and this massive tent full of food that you can eat in 24 hours a day and just like game centers and everything's free. It, it's like, I think people would go on holiday there if they could. <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's so easy to get distracted in a Paralympic village because there's everything you could ever wish for. Um and obviously you're there with some of your best friends, so um it's pretty special. But yeah, going into my races, so the hundred meter was first. I had the heat in the morning and then the final in the evening. Um so yeah, the hundred, I just I was so relaxed. I don't even know how. I wish I could be that relaxed now. Um, I remember sitting under the stands, like that's where the call room was before the race. So I'd done all my warm up and we'd gone through first call, second call, in final call. And the, the ground was like, it was actually shaking. The floor was shaking from the noise of the people outside. And I remember looking around and every other girl was just, just pale, like a really pale shade of green. They looked horrendous. And I was just buzzing. I was just talking to everyone. It was like all the officials having a nice chat, like just just enjoying it. And then I went out and um, my mum told me, because uh, on my, my warm-up lap, I stopped to do a practice start. And she's, I'd said to my parents before it all, I'd said, right, I want you to sit right at the back. I don't want to see you. I don't want to hear you. I don't even want to know you're there. And she said, I'd stopped to do my practice start. And my dad saw it and thought there was something wrong with my chair. So I started like bounding down the stairs from like the third tier to try and get to me to help me, bless him. Um, but I obviously didn't see him. 
Um, so yeah, I just rolled around and I mean, I think I was in the easier of the two heats anyway, so I was pretty confident that I could just get through. So I just made the agreement. But I'd made the agreement that we were just going to, you know, easily qualify and me being me just went for it because I thought, well, I don't do anything easy, so let's get a Paralympic record while we're at it. <laughs> and then um, obviously came back to the final and um, it's still just chill. Just, I don't know, I was just so excited to be there. I knew that no one really knew my name. No one knew who I was. I was just this 20-year-old girl from Halifax. And um, people were going to cheer for you whether you came first, last, or somewhere in the middle. People were just excited that this event was in their country. So, uh, yeah, like, I wish I remember more of it, but just sitting on the line and I just remember crossing the line and feeling like I had to do something, but I wasn't sure what. Uh, you watch all these Olympic and Paralympic champions doing these massive celebrations. They are so not natural. I don't know. They must plan them for weeks because <laughs> I crossed the line and I was like, oh, okay, like that's, that's it. That's cool, right? But normally when we compete, we're just racing in domestic meets and um, kind of the next race is already lined up behind you so you just get off and get on with your day. So I just kind of hurried off and I wasn't really sure and anti-doping were waiting for me. So I just went to them and I feel like I wasted that opportunity a little bit. So I watched the games a bit more over the following week and learned a bit from the pros um, and then had the 200 metres a week later. Um, so for the 200, I think I'd got a bit too big for my boots by now. I was a bit too cocky. <laughs> in, the, in those few days. <laughs> in those few days, I thought I could rule the world. And uh, as, as I think any 20-year-old 20, 20 would, <laughs> I'd become Paralympic champion. Um, so Peter rang me the morning of the race, the 200-meter race, and just said, oh, look, I don't want you to worry, but I just want you to be prepared because I don't think you're going to win tonight. So, you know, make the final, but... You know, don't be upset if you're not on the golden spot. That was it then. I was, oh, I'd lost my head. I was like, oh, Peter, don't believe in me. That's it. Games is over. I'm not going to win. So I went out, did my heat. Like, still not nervous, more just angry. Angry that that's what he thought of me. Uh, so, yeah, the, the heat was not quiet. There were still 80,000 people there, but. There definitely wasn't the electricity that there is for a final. And then uh, I obviously had the whole rest of the day to just waste because my final was at like half past nine at night or something. So we have um, like a hair salon in the village where you can go and get your hair cut and your nails done. <laughs> it's luxury. It's luxury. Um, and I'd made friends with the, the hair the hairdresser so I went in and she uh she created the famous red white and blue braids that I wore um just just because all my friends were competing that day so I wanted someone just to help me relax and chill out a little bit so yeah she did my hair went back that night um and I just sat on the start line and I just thought you know what for my whole life people have told me that I can't do things and here I am on the, st on the start line as Paralympic champion of a home Paralympic Games. I mean, if that's not proving people wrong, I don't know what is. So why am I why am I going to let Peter get in my head and, and think that I can't do this? I've beat all these girls before, um, so let's just try to do it again. There's no expectation. I don't have to do it. So just gave myself a, you know, a little bit of a pep talk. Got going. And um, I knew, you know, I had my whole plan just there in front of me. I had to, I knew I had to reach 17 miles an hour in the race to win the race. Um, I had to get a good bend. I had to hit my compensate clean and I had to get a good start. So I just kind of sat on the line going through my race plan. And I just went and I hit 17 miles an hour within about 70 meters. So that was all good. And then... As soon as I crossed the line, I looked up and Peter was there in the crowd and I just pointed at him and just shouted, 17. And he was just laughing. He was just laughing his head off because, you know, he said to me later that night, he said, oh, I knew you could win it, but you were just getting a, you getting a bit on my nerves. So I just started bringing you back down a bit. Um, 
And after that, obviously, I'd already watched a lot of people race and win, so I just milked it. But it was cool. You know, I did a two and a half hour victory lap. Um, I missed my medal ceremony because I was doing a victory lap. Um, just had a great time, really. <laughs> Yeah, I remember I was I was in the crowd that night actually. I had a ticket for that night. No and way. yeah, you I, I do remember you being on that lap of honor for a long time. It's like, yeah. well, she is she's still she's still around there <laughs> doing doing some autographs. Why well, not? I was like, I'm done. I'm gonna stay out here. Because it, it just I don't that if anyone, even if you're in the crowd, if we could relive any part of that whole games, I think everyone would jump at the chance. I think I've met like the whole 80,000 people that were in that stadium that night, everyone I meet was like, oh, yeah, I was there, I was there. So I just think everyone would go back. And I think by that point, I'd appreciated that that London was something special and that I had to, I had to just try and get as much of it as I could. I, I kind of feel like I could have done more, you know. That two and a half victory <laughs> lap wasn't long enough. Should have done longer. Not enough. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that whole game, obviously, for the Paralympics was, was huge. Like you said, 80,000 people were there for your heat, let alone the final. <laughs> I mean, that just doesn't happen. We'll never get it again, I don't think, sadly. It was outstanding. <laughs> and, yeah, just going back to that night, I mean, for just for the British team, obviously, you had Johnny Peacock winning the gold, Dave Weir again winning a gold, and then you. It was, it was the night to be there. And I guess, what did you feel like from the team point of view? Was there a real buzz around it that night? Oh, I think because myself and Johnny, we'd started, you know, competing at the same time. We were new faces. We were young blood. Just the excitement, like we were young. We wanted to party. We wanted to celebrate. And uh, we had the same group of friends at that time. So it was it was just, we all got back and it was just a massive, massive party. You know, it was so exciting. And I think, you know, we we were excited for ourselves, but we didn't really understand how big it was outside of that stadium. You know, when you're in the village, there's no newspapers or magazines or TV or internet, nothing. You you are literally in a bubble. And we kind of were just excited at what we'd achieved, you know, we're excited for each other. And then um, the next day we, myself and Johnny went out into the Westfield uh, shopping center because our accreditation got us really good discount in all the shops, so I had to make the most of that. <laughs> um, and before we left, we got offered bodyguards, and we were like, what are you on about? It'll be fine. So we went out, and literally, like, we went into a newsagent's, and there was myself or Johnny or Dave Weir's face on the front of every newspaper, you know, Thriller Thursday written everywhere, and it was just like, wow, like, a lot of people were watching that that's it was not what we were expecting and not what we thought was happening out there at all um so it was quite an eye-opening moment and literally we were out for about five hours and we went in about five shops because everywhere we went people were stopping us and getting pictures and autographs and it was it was crazy and it was at the same time kind of scary because we just didn't expect it we didn't you know, we'd, we'd kind of been taught to think, ah, oh, you know, after the games, life just goes back to normal because that's what it's done for so long. But I guess we were just at the right games that completely, completely change your life. Um, so, yeah, it was it was an eye-opening moment. And I think we, we probably both of us just partied for the next few months. <laughs> and then, well, end of the year, you get... You find out you get in an MBE. I mean, that's another way to cap off a, a great year. Well, you know, why not just get it all while you rally <laughs> at it? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I remember getting that and it just felt surreal. It was like, are you sure this is for me? Are you sure? Like, all I did was do what I love, you know, and I do wheelchair racing because I enjoy it, not because I want all these other accolades that come with it. I mean, they're nice, but they're definitely not the aim. Um, and it was a real, it was a very strange moment collecting the MBE. I got mine from um, Prince Charles in about, I think I got it in a, about April or May uh, in 2013. And um, I was in the line, uh, I was in, in the line next to Bombardier Ben Parkinson. 
um, who like lost his legs and got severe brain damage uh, at war and he was getting an MBE as well and I was just stood thinking well either he's not getting enough or I'm getting too much because I've just gone out and had fun and and he's literally put his life on the line so it's a very odd system our honours system how they uh how they rank people's uh achievements I guess but an honour all the same but um yeah weird everything just changed London just changed everything <laughs> yes yeah, life was never the same for you after London um but then yeah 2013 two more gold medals at the world champs and then you were also the first Paralympian to be nominated for sports personality outside of a Paralympic year was um yeah I, re I remember watching that because yeah, I remember your VT was quite nice and you was talking about how you just you don't need all these high-tech facilities you just need the hills of Yorkshire <laughs> is that still the case well I live in Chester now so similar story just different setting you know obviously I've needed it this year more than ever yeah. um just to carry on you know I think as a wheelchair racer it can be so difficult not to get wrapped up in all the equipment and all the you know specialization of different things and just to realize the beauty of what we do you know I can take my race chair and pretty much go where I want so I just you know like I said I love that freedom and, and I could never go running in the hills so the race chair let me do that but yeah like it's not changed. I still love going out on the roads and, and just pushing around. And um, I do it a little quicker now than I did then. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and just uh, in terms of like those other gold medals, again, you, you already had the pressure of after winning London, I assume. So did you, did you ever think of, oh, have I done enough? You know, am I still good enough? Or was, did you knew, know you were going to win those two goals? No, I don't think any of those doubts crept in for a few years, to be honest. Um, had a good few years after a good couple of years after London 2012 where I was just confident Hannah we just went into races and won them for fun really and um the challenge just wasn't really there um and I think at the time I like I really liked that you know I was frustrated that there wasn't the challenge but at the same time I liked that it was easy you know if I kept training I kept winning and that's that's what it was all about so um yeah I think but at the same time it just doesn't make a story you know I think back to those medals and I'm like oh yeah the Leon the world champion nice to win but was expected and then um and then obviously it all changed in 2014 when uh, the International Paralympic Committee changed my events I went from the 100 200 that I did in London to doing the 100 800 which was uh quite a big jump um, so the first time I, I raced that was at the Europeans in Swansea, um, and that's that's when I think I was really truly starting to be challenged. <laughs> yeah, what was your thoughts behind that? Because obviously taking away one of your Paralympic events is pretty bad, and then saying actually we're going to make it eight times well eight times longer than your other event. <laughs> oh, I was disgusted. <laughs> no, I was heartbroken. I, I think I think all the girls were the eight hundred was a massive challenge for all of us. Um, it's a lot, lot longer than what we were used to doing. And it's a big stretch, you know, to, to train for the one and the eight. You would never ask a, an able-bodied sprinter to do that. So it was very much, you know, get my head together with my coach. You know, by this point, I was no longer working with Peter. Um, I started working with my current coach, Jenny Banks, in uh, 2013. Um, so we just had to sit down and, you know, she just said, are you up for it? Do you just want to do the 100? Do you just want to do the 8? And I was like, no, I want to do both. <laughs> like, what's the point of training for one event? I can do it all. Um, so, yeah, but I had a lot of learning to do and I hated the 800 for a long, long, long time. <laughs> I guess because it's not just like a 100 metres, it's just a sprint. This is obviously kind of tactical and there's other, you know, you're a bit closely racing each other, you know, you can elbows out and all that kind of stuff. Were they the kind of challenges you were expecting? Well, first off, the biggest challenge was getting around two laps of the track. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, then after that, the tactics are hard to learn because they change every single race, you know, they're never the same. And um, that that was the bit that scared me. You know, I didn't really have anyone to practice them with. Um, and 
literally tactics can make it or break it you can be the fittest person in the race but if you don't get your tactics right you're not going to win um and i learned that a few times you know messing up my tactics and really having to sprint it out with someone but actually it's quite a fun race once you get used to it it's quite fun <laughs> not too bad i am only saying that now i've only just come around to it <laughs> Um, and then 2015 brings us on to our third defining moment, which is when you, which I still think is crazy that you actually lost your first race. Your <laughs> seven year unbeaten streak came to an end, which is ridiculous that it was that, that long, really. Um, you lost to your uh, British colleague, uh, Carrie Denigan in Newham. And obviously she was young, obviously very young and probably was in a wheelchair way before you were in terms of age. Um, <laughs> So, and I guess she'd seen you compete at the Paralympics and must have obviously been inspired. So how, how was that for you to then actually lose and it to be someone like your next, the next generation behind you coming up? It hurt. It hurt big time. It injured me. Oh, no. <laughs> um, I think the toughest part about it was, was it wasn't the actual getting beaten. That upset me and that wasn't a nice experience, but ultimately it didn't bother me that much because I knew that I'd made massive mistakes in that race. Um, I knew exactly why it had happened. But what hurt me more was the coverage and the reaction from the media after it. You know, it was... It ultimately, it was just a little domestic race in Newham. Um, had Carrie not beaten me there, then no one would have even known that we'd raced because our little events don't get any coverage at all. It was It was just a nothing race. I'd spent um, the whole week training 400s with my coach and just I just messed it up. We'd been training on slow track the whole week, then moved to a fast track to race and I was just tired of watching my speedo and I just never never picked up. Um, so, yeah, you won't believe the amount of times I've replayed that race in my head, just thinking, wow, if I'd have just pushed like I can... I, I should never have lost that race, but it happened. But yeah, the next day, literally the headlines just tore me apart and it was horrible. It was so horrible to get used to because it was literally like Cockcroft lost her crown. She, you know, she's been pus pushed off the throne. She's finished. She's done. She's been beaten by a 15 year old. She'll never race again. And it was just like, wow, it's one race, like one race and you've just eliminated seven years of hard work one race um it was horrible and like you say ultimately i think that that the headlines should have been celebrating the fact you know uh, the london legacy is alive and well you know look at what talent we woke up during london 2012 look who's been inspired you know she she beat me when she was i think she was about 15 years old at 15 i'd only just sat in a race chair for the first time you know, she got in a race chair at 11. Uh, so we'd actually been racing, but I'd not been racing that much longer there anyway. So I think that's, you know, a massive thing in para sport is that age doesn't matter. Age is, age comes down to opportunity and I hadn't had that opportunity. Um, but yeah, it was rough and it pushed me to make some big, big decisions. Um, following that race, I dropped out of university. I was in my second year. Um, not really getting much support to balance the training, the travel, the course, everything. Um, so yeah, took a gap year and never went back. Um, moved home back to my parents, back to my Yorkshire Hills, and um, yeah, really got my head down because that race we were like, I think we were like six or eight weeks out from the World Championships, so it it shook me a lot that something might not happen in my favour at oh, World Championships. I wasn't used to that feeling. It was very new. I guess, yeah, I say, I guess you've never had that kind of press either. You've never had that kind of negative reaction. It's always been happy headlines for Hannah because she's won another gold. And it just, like you say, even though it wasn't a major meet, it was still a big news. Yeah, it was a massive wake-up call that people are only your biggest fans when you're winning. Um, and people will very quickly jump on bandwagons and pull you apart when you're not at your absolute best. Um, and it's something that I've, you know, had to now face a bit in my career and it's not the nicest time, but yeah, the first time was just horrendous. You know, it, it had me considering if I wanted to carry on, if I was going to stay in the sport, all because of one race, which is <laughs> <it's> ridiculous. <laughs> 
Well, it still didn't stop you winning three gold medals at those world champs, so that's <laughs> that's something. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> um, and then, well, 2016 Paralympic year rolls around again. It's in Rio this time, and there was a little bit of doubt whether it would actually happen, wasn't there? A few weeks out. Yeah. So actually, I only learnt this when I watched uh, the Rising Phoenix documentary. <laughs> yeah. Same. I had no idea. I was obviously very well protected during that time because I honestly was watching the documentary like. Oh my god, I didn't I didn't know that this was all happening. When were the games not gonna happen? They were always gonna happen. So yeah, apparently a questionable time. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess it's good that you didn't know. Maybe I was <laughs> I didn't want to straight make your mind like, think about other things. Um but yeah, then obviously Rio, three gold medals, you you did it, you got the eight hundred and everything and what was that what was that whole games like? Rio was very different to London. Um not not all in a bad way. Uh, obviously not a home game, so it was never going to be as special as London was. Uh, it was a little bit quieter. Um, but still, actually, the medals, in a racing sense, probably mean more because they were harder to win. Obviously, my competition had stepped up quite a lot. Um, I wasn't just you know winning everything that I ever entered anymore, so uh, it wasn't nailed on that I would win. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we we had the four hundred added like six months before the games, so I had six months to learn a four hundred meters, which wasn't that bad because we were already training for the eight. But um, more opportunities and and just had to completely rejig plans. You know, the whole way through, um, my heats for the hundred and eight hundred were cancelled with about six hours notice. So I had three straight finals, which is not what I planned, uh, well not not what I prepared for, um, but it was it was still you know amazing. Um, it's still great being there, and the support that we even got there was just brilliant. So um, yeah, I enjoyed it. It was just different. <laughs> Is it frustrating getting those like last minute changes, especially for Paralympians as, as a whole? There's often like, oh, we're going to change this classification, we're going to merge this, we're going to drop that event and bring this one in. Do you often do you find that a bit frustrating? Um, it's always worked in my favour, so not really. I mean, dr obviously dropping the heats was annoying because it was so, like, literally I was dressed and ready to go. I was leaving for the bus and the head coach just started chasing me like, no, don't go, you've not got a race today now. Um, it kind of felt a little bit embarrassing telling, like, family and friends, oh, by the way, don't tune in tonight because now I'm not racing. Um that doesn't have that shouldn't happen in professional sport you know we should know who's competing but a uh, whole last minute changes but yeah i think there's a lot of things in para sport that are questionable that are difficult and and uh that are just barriers that i guess no other sport really has to deal with um you know you mentioned classification and it's one of my biggest bugbears anyway so <laughs> Um, it's it's a necessary system. It's something that we need in our sport, but it probably needs refining. Um, and it needs refining prior to games. You know, it's it's too late. Once we're there, we've all put our absolute all into what you're about to see. So I don't really want races cancelled and you know people missing races because they've suddenly had their class changed. So it, it's it's you know it's difficult, but I guess everyone has management problems. <laughs> Yeah, it does, it does always seem to happen just before the games, though. It's always a bit frustrating. Um, but they say it worked out in your favour for the 400. You got a world record, and then that was obviously setting you up nicely for the home world championships in London. How great was it to be back in that stadium again? It was so good, but I was so ill for the whole championships. I was so, so ill. Um, the, the night before the 100 metre final... I got food poisoning at the hotel, so spent the majority of the night throwing my guts up and just generally feeling absolutely vile. So when I got on the start line the next day, I hadn't eaten in about 24 hours and hadn't slept, and I was horrendous. Um, and I broke the world record, so <laughs> there you go. obviously was the lightest I'd ever been. <laughs> um, and then I got hit by a terrible cold. Um, so the the eight was next. It wasn't so bad. I just couldn't breathe through it. So that wasn't fun. 
Um, and then the 400 was last. And I knew it was my last 400 uh, on an international stage because after that, IPC were changing my events again. So I really wanted to enjoy it. And I was just so, so, so ill. Like there's a picture of me on the start line and I literally look like I'm about to just throw up everywhere. I'm so pale and I'm all like droopy. Um, and you know what, that race, I remember it so vividly because I just went into like autopilot. I was just like, right, I've trained this. I've just got to get through this race and then I can go back to bed. Like I've just like on the start line, I was seriously considering just withdrawing and not doing the race. But I was like, oh, my mom's come and everyone's here. So I probably should do it. Um, and I think I came like, I came within like 0.1 of a second in my world record or something mad like that. So I was a bit annoyed when I crossed the line, like, ah, if I was a well, I could have broke the world record. So, um, an amazing championships. And I'm so, even now, I'm so gutted that illness kind of ruined it for me because I knew it was going to be good. I knew it was going to be the closest we could get to London 2012 again. And I was just plagued the whole time. It was horrible. <laughs> It didn't stop you winning three gold medals, but I guess I guess it shows that your training was that year was obviously pretty pretty good because you you can be ill and still win those three golds. I know I know you'd done a few fifteen hundreds that year, and were you working on endurance and, and trying to get stronger? Yeah, yeah. So I think that year taught me that year was really important because it taught me how important training was. You know, it's important. You know, everyone always says, "Oh, you know, the training's hard and the winning's easy." And I think that year just kind of put that into perspective for me. I wouldn't have been able to do that if I couldn't push a 400 on autopilot. You know, imagine what I could have done had I been able to actually think about what I was trying to do. I think we'd just been splitting it equally. Um, the 1500 was literally just, there was an opportunity to race it. I was at the meet anyway, so I just went for it and took the world record, <laughs> as you do. Um <laughs> It was literally just filling a day, so that's why I did the 15. But we had been focusing on the 8. I focused quite solidly on the 8 for quite a few years um, because it was such a learning step. Um, and I think the 8 in London, we actually even had a bit of drafting, which we don't really normally have, so it came in useful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, would would we ever see you go further than 1,500 metres? Uh, not by choice, but if the IPC put it in, then I haven't got an option, have I? <laughs> <laughs> I would love to one day do a marathon. Um, my issue is that I can feel I have full sensation in my legs. So I don't know if I'd be able to sit on them long enough to get through the marathon. Um, but I would one day just like to do it. I don't care how long it takes me, just get through it. But competitively, Probably not. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, obviously, you've been great success. You've won all, all these gold medals. And then, well, going into 2018, and your kind of fourth defining moment was losing your world record to, to carry and then also getting beaten in the championships. How, how, how was that? Oh, I thought 2015 was bad, but 2018 was the worst ever. I kind of knew from the beginning that I wasn't having a good year. Um, I kind of start my season out in Switzerland and I didn't get any decent times. I didn't break any world records. I didn't, I just didn't have the results that I normally get. So that's kind of when I started worrying a little bit. Um, and then obviously we went to the anniversary games, which is where Carrie took my 100 meter world record. Um, really want to be there I didn't feel in shape I didn't feel ready to race which is not a good headspace for an athlete to be in um and I, I was really worried going up to her I was really nervous I knew in my heart of hearts I knew she was going to beat me and I knew she was going to do something good because her face was on all the programs they had a big like uh spread about her in the program they had like a movie about her before the race and I was like on the start line like oh oh dear <laughs> I'm about to get it handed to me I think um and I did and that hurt that hurt really bad um just because 
you know, that year I'd been filming for Country File. Um, so my first presenting role, which I was really, really excited about having. Um, and it, it was just too big a distraction, but I hadn't noticed it at the right time. So then when I noticed it, it was too late and I was in too deep with the presenting and I had to race. It was, it was just too much. It was 2015 all over again. It was too much. But you only ever realise that it's too much when it's too late, I think. So there was not a whole lot I could do by it. So between anniversary games and Europeans in Berlin, um, I went away and trained really, really hard, did loads of testing. And the day before the 100 metres in Berlin, I brought the world record in my own in my training session. I nailed it. I was flying. And I was like, right, it's fine. I'm back on track. I'm fine. And the next day, I just couldn't. I just couldn't recreate it. I just couldn't find it in me to do it again. And I I practically gave up before the race had even started. And I think a big part of it for me was the fact that we weren't guaranteed a European race. So for the whole year, it was kind of like, oh, you, know, you might have a race there, but you might also might not, so don't count on it. So I'd found something else to fill my year, and then suddenly we had this race, and, and I was too distracted. Um, so now I've kind of learned, oh, just always expect that there's going to be a race because there probably is going to be one. Um, but that year forced me again to make a lot of changes. You know, like I said, 2015 did. This time coming out of 2018, I moved house, bought my first home in Chester. So I moved training groups, uh, got a new S&C coach. I literally turned my life upside down and said, right, if I'm not winning by this time next year, then that's me done because there's nothing else I can do now. Like, And I knew 2018 I wasn't training that hard, but 2019 I trained my bum off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you mentioned that like, you were doing some like presenting for Country Valor. And do, you, do you feel like coming with obviously like five Paralympic golds, there's obviously a little bit more obligation to do kind of things like that? I know you've done like like sport relief strictly and you've done bake off and obviously they're great fun do you, i mean i assume you enjoy them but at the same time do you have to balance it out and weigh it up to see am i doing too much of this compared to the training yeah i i love them <laughs> that's why i do them <laughs> um and yeah but you do have to you do have to get it right um and it did distract me it definitely distracted me big time because um i just get too carried away with them to be honest but the presenting uh, the country file, it wasn't even down to, to the, the Paralympic titles. It, it wasn't to do with any of that. It was, it was just an opportunity. Um, I'd done a, a presenting course earlier in the year um, with British Athletics and then country file had seen my show reel and uh, offered me the job. And it, it just seemed like too big, too big a job to turn down. It was like my dream job. So thinking I had no Europeans, I was like, yeah, cool, let's go for it. You know what? I don't regret it. I absolutely loved it. I would, I would do it again every day. It was, it was amazing. Such a good opportunity. Um, but ultimately, at the end of it, they said, "Oh, you know, this doesn't really fit around your racing, does it?" And I, I have to be honest and just say, "No, I can't. I can't do fourteen-hour days on set and then go home and train. It, it doesn't work." Um, and and all the travel that's involved, especially with a show like that, was immense. But the rest of it is a lot more, you know, the more reality-based stuff is a lot a lot easier to do. You know, they're used to working with management and they're used to working around the other things that you have to do. So Strictly, for example, you know, I would I would dance 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and then go back to my hotel room and train on my rollers. Um, it was a, a massive balance in that because that was the same time I was nominated for sports personality. So that was a very busy time of year but um they're all amazing i love doing them it's just it's just great opportunities and you have to take them because they're they're never going to come back you're never going to get them again so i think you have to appreciate everything you get and give it a go but remember what your actual real job is which sometimes i forget <laughs> <laughs> how's your baking been during lockdown have you got any better <laughs> uh i have done no baking in lockdown uh, I don't ever want to bake again after Bake Off. <laughs> I'd never baked before Bake Off, so I bake after it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and obviously, like going back to the the, the, the year of twenty eighteen, um, seeing like your, again your young younger 
rival kind of win that gold medal. How how is it? Obviously, she's a teammate. Um, what's your relationship like? Is it tough because she's obviously, I guess, you see each other quite a lot and you do a lot of media together. But at the same time, she is also going for that gold medal that you're going for. You know what? We're absolutely fine with each other. We're obviously not the best of friends. I don't think any rivals are ever going to be that. But I think we have a level of respect for each other. This rivalry that we have has drawn people to want to watch our sport, which is ultimately what we both want. Um, it's it's the competition that I've always been crying out for and it's it's a story for her you know it's built her into one of the better known names of the team so it, it's really worked well for us both and you know when we're together on race day you know we don't talk that's I think that's pretty self-explanatory but you know once we've crossed that line you know you saw it last year at the world championships you know she gave me a hug uh, after the races and uh, she's always really complimentary and, you know, always says that I was the one who inspired her, um, which makes me feel ancient. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, yeah, I guess like you said there, we're going on to your, well, your, your fifth defining moment was that World Champs um, to get get that, well, get the world record back, get the gold medal back and, like you say, and, well, and to beat her in that final. <laughs> Sounds so vicious, but it's true. Um, I think after I'd, I'd literally turned my life upside down in 2018 to get it right. The world champs in 2019 were, they were my defining moment in deciding what I was going to do next. You know, do I carry on racing? Have I got a future here? Have I, you know, is that it for me? Have I finished my gold medal streak? What, you know, I needed answers and I I had no idea what the answer was going to be. I hadn't, gone anywhere near 17 you know sub 17 seconds all season so the time that I did was definitely not a time I was expecting um I did 1670 1676 and Carrie's world record was 1678 I think so literally like a hair but I still did it and I remember I'm not I'm not an emotional person at all like to me a race is a race I don't get excited I don't really I just get on with it. But I remember crossing the line and one of my best friends, Jodie Hannigan, she's a, a sports photographer, so she was there photographing it. And she just looked up at me and like nodded towards the time and I looked and I just like I was holding back tears because I just couldn't believe the time. In my head, I was just like, okay, Carrie's probably going to win this and you're going to have to be all right with that and you're going to have to just deal with the headlines. Like, you're the 800 metre racer now. That's what you are. Um, And I'd kind of just settled on that. I'd made peace with the fact that that's what competition is. And I think I was just so relaxed, so so at ease with what might happen that everything just pulled together and and thankfully paid off. But, yeah, I looked at that time and... uh, it was it was not it was not what I was expecting at all. It was beyond my wildest dreams because it's a time that I've chased for like seven years and I've never got close to it. I just could never break that seventeen second barrier. Um, it's a bit annoying that Carrie got there first, but you know I've done it twice now. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess thinking back to when you've like when you did lose the race here before and all that, do you feel like being the top of your game for so long and winning all those gold medals was was there any a little bit of complacency that snuck in or do you think it was just it was what it was no it was massive complacency i got you know i got complacent going into 2015 and i got knocked down a few pegs and then i let myself get back to that stage and i think now i've learned my lesson thankfully (laughs) you can't be complacent in sport if you don't work the hardest then you're not going to win and um it was it was definitely complacency that lost it for me you know it wasn't that I wasn't working hard but I wasn't working smart I was going into races you know not warming up properly just messing about a bit on the start line um and and you you know it it always showed in my performances so this time it's never happening again (laughs) I guess um when you say when you've won all those gold medals and you are like before she before she carry came along I guess the motivation was just to win more goals, but I suppose now you've got this rival, there's a bit more of a motivation, but what what does motivate you? What does drive you forward? Um, winning and winning and that rivalry and ultimately just, just wanting to see what I can do. I think, 
you know, the last few years have shown me that sport is not all about winning. Winning's nice, but it's not the be all and end all. Um, I race now not to beat Carrie. I, I I train to beat the best in the world. You know, I would love to just be the fastest wheelchair racer ever. And I don't, I don't know if I'll ever get that. But if that's what you aim for, then you might one day achieve it. So I think the motivation is just getting faster. You know, I want to know. I want to know what my limits are. Um, this year, I raced three times, um, once down at Stoke Mandeville, and I broke four world records in four hours. And I knocked six seconds off the 800 metre time. I went under... My world record is 155, and I did a 149. Um, I don't know where it came from. I don't know how I did it. But now I have to recreate it next year. And that's the challenge, really. It's, it's working out how you went that fast and then doing it again a bit better, a bit better. Um, and I think just my motivations throughout my career have changed. You know, it used to be the top of the podium. It used to be the medals and the all the nice things you get when you get the medals. And they're still, you know, good stuff. It's still nice. But ultimately, I just want to I just want to finish in this sport knowing that I'm the best I could have been. And, you know, I'm not leaving anything out, really. And Obviously, I want to give people the race that they want to see. We're never going to drive our sport forward if suddenly the same person's winning all the time again. So it's good for me to have Carrie there. And obviously, there's other girls coming through and we're building into one of the most competitive female para sport, para racers. So that's exciting for me. It's exciting to be at the charge of that and, and to lead it forward. And then Tokyo, what's what's the ideal outcome for you, for Tokyo for you? Well, well, two gold medals. I don't think I don't think you should go to a Paralympics wanting anything less. I don't think you should go to any race wanting anything less in the first place. Um, I don't know how I'll feel if I don't get the gold, but I'm just going to work as hard as I can to know that when I'm there, I've done everything I can to be in the best position. And then just looking a bit beyond that, they, they announced recently that the Commonwealth Games is going to have uh, more power sport in, including races for you. And I guess how how is that going to be to compete in front of a home crowd again? Oh, I'm so excited. I've had every other championships at home. Um, it'll be my first Commonwealth Games. And obviously in Birmingham, so closer to home than ever. Um, and it's just the one that's been missing for me. You know, it's been the one that has always avoided me somehow. And finally, I'm getting my chance. So I didn't ever really know if I wanted to continue beyond Tokyo or, you know, try and move on to something else. But Commonwealth Games is pulling me in a bit too much so that's the plan and that's definitely what I'll be working for. And obviously they are bringing more Parasport into the Commonwealth Games and I actually I asked this question to Tanny Gray Thompson a few weeks back and said you know what do you think about merging you know the two you know able-bodied and, and Parasports and she was like not so much for the Olympics and Paralympics keep them separate but Commonwealth level European level they could work well together what do you think about that? Yeah I completely agree I think I'm a proud Paralympian and I like that we have our own event. Maybe they could be brought slightly closer together. You know, I said maybe even in Tokyo, how good would it be? Uh, you know, you have the Olympic opening ceremony, but then there's no Olympic closing ceremony. It just kind of carries on until our closing ceremony. And then it's not two separate events, but it's two separate events, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but I think every other level could be integrated. You know, we've shown that this year the British champs had para events uh, included for the first time ever. Um, and it worked really well. You know, we, it, well, I think it did. <laughs> Maybe that's because I was actually involved for once. Um, but I think it worked really well. And I'd like to see more, um, more events trying to do that integration because it is possible. And ultimately it's just athletics you know if you like athletics then you should like either olympic or paralympic so yeah maybe not the top level but below that i don't see any reason why not and with tokyo being delayed a year that obviously does make it only a three-year gap to paris will we be seeing you in paris in 2024 i hope so um it's on the plans now i think yeah it's close to home again and I'm not even going to draw the line there. So, yeah, I want to get there. I've got to make the team first and last that long. But it's only only three years away, so that's a bit scary. <laughs> um, and then just in terms of the, the Paralympic movement as a whole, since you joined the sport, you know, 10 years ago, how have you, how have you seen it 
progress and where do you think it can go in the next 10 years? Oh, para sport has progressed tenfold. You know, the amount of athletes we have in it, the coverage that we now get, the interest that it has. Um, I think it's so much easier for people to get involved in para sport now, which is something that I obviously struggled with when I started out. I think that's the most important part of it. Um, but we can still improve on all those areas. You know, we can still get more coverage, more home, you know, home names that everyone knows. And we can still make it a lot, lot easier for people to get involved. So we've just got to keep working on the same things. And, and for the actual athletes, we've just got to keep the interest there. So, so you know, there are stories to write about us. There are things that will make people interested and there are clubs for people to come to uh, to one day replace us. And then what, I guess, what happens when you, when you do decide to call time on your career? What what do you fancy doing next? Um, I'm in between. I don't know what I want to do. Either go back to my presenting. Uh, I'd love to spend some more time country file and, and doing things like that. Um, but I also kind of want to, I don't know, be the head coach. So I think I have a lot of experience and it would be a shame to take it out of the sport. So I don't know, watch this space and we'll see where I end up. <laughs> Luckily, you won't have to think about that for a while yet. So, <laughs> hope not. <laughs> um, I just want to ask you of your five defining moments, which I'll just remind you were the first time you sat in a chair, um, the London 2012 Paralympics, uh, losing that first race, losing your world record, and then getting back your world record. Um, of those five, which one moment do you think has defined you the most? Hmm, that's a hard question. You know what? I think. 2018 was my defining year so losing the world record losing my first race was was my defining moment I think that that's made me the athlete that I am today um I can't be the athlete that I am without all the experiences together but I think that was the one that forced me to make the most change and ultimately hopefully is the reason why we'll see a bit more success in the future um obviously you've had a few like the highs and lows uh, during your career most have been highs but do you think those low moments that we've obviously talked about have really made you appreciate the high moments a little bit more oh definitely I think the low moments are almost the most important part of a career um because they're the time that I sure realize that um winning is not easy you know even if I think it is it's it's really not and there's a lot that goes behind it so as much as the high moments are really, really nice, without the low moments, like you say, you just don't appreciate them. I just got far too used to them and it took me getting knocked down to, to really appreciate being back on top and knowing that I'm there because I'm the best in the world and that's the only reason. Well, they say it's easy to get to the top, but it's even harder to stay there. So <laughs> I can I can confirm. <laughs> um. Is there anything or any any races that you'd do differently if you had your time again? Oh, that 400 in 2015. <laughs> I think that will haunt me forever. Um, aside from that, I don't think so. I've had fun. I've had some good races. But that's the only one that sticks in my head as the biggest mistake. But then like I said, had it not happened like that, what you wouldn't have changed things. Exactly. So it was a blessing in disguise, but... That's the one that still hurts. <laughs> you, still, you still rather have won. <laughs> um, what would you tell the young Hannah Cockroft who was just starting out in life? What would you advice you'd give her? Um, take every opportunity. You know, even if you don't think you'll enjoy it, you'll either love it or learn from it. So grab them all. Don't be scared. And just go for it. You know, there is independence out there for everyone. You just have to be brave enough to go and try and find it and uh enjoy it enjoy it all and soak it up enjoy the memories because your brain's not strong enough to remember them <laughs> <laughs> um and my final question is obviously sport has been you know the, it's the reason why we're chatting um what does sport mean to you and how important is it in your life oh sport is my life um i definitely wouldn't have what i have now without it and that's not just you know money or medals or whatever else experiences it's it's genuine independence and freedom um without sport i never would have learned some most of the skills you know i never would have learned that i was able to do some of the things i've done and physically you know it's it's made my disability easier to 
live with and made things easier to do. So sport has literally changed my life. Um, and I think that's why it should be available to everyone and everyone should be getting out and trying to get involved. Yeah, amen to that. <laughs> well, um, thank you so much for being on My Defining Moments, Anna. It's been really interesting going through your, your career and all the highs, oh, mostly highs, <laughs> and uh, all the best going forward, and hopefully we'll see more bling around those shoulders <laughs> in Tokyo. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Hannah. That was a really lovely chat there with a fellow northerner. <laughs> it's really great to hear that she's still got a few more Paralympic cycles in her. Join me again soon for more My Defining Moments. Uh, you can subscribe on all the major podcast apps and feel free to rate or comment. You can reach me on social media at Chris Brown Sport and thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.